Hey guys, thanks for joining. We have a great guest today, Eric Jacobus, a martial artist, a stuntman, a motion capture guy, and many more, a, a great beardsman. <laughs> and tell Beards. him we got the evolution. Oh, we got the, the evolution. Beard. Yes, of course. Brian the Beast Robinson right here on the upper left. You know what's funny, Brian? Like when I posted a video, I cut up part of the Simon Reese segment when we were live. And in that segment, when he was talking about best of the best, you didn't really say anything since somebody was like, who's that dude in the top left corner? I was like, well, that's Brian the Beast Robinson, as if they should know that name. But they soon <laughs> yeah. will. They soon will as this podcast cast gets more that's and more right. popular. But anyway, um, how long did this take to grow, man? Uh, let's see. I shaved it about what, Monday, Tuesday. Monday, Tuesday? Yeah. Wow. No, I, uh, it's about, I think when I went to India to do Man Who Feels No Pain, I stopped, I stopped shaving. It was about... It was about your size when I went to India. Oh, really? And then, um, and then, so at a certain point, and maybe it's because the gray is starting to take over. The gray hairs will push the black hairs out. So it's, there's this long period where there's no growth, and but but it's like grayer and grayer. And I'm I'm hoping that when I finally go fully gray, it'll it'll get down here finally because it's just you look like there. gandalf you look like a wizard <laughs> then a wise when you reach the master level of kung fu yes <laughs> i was like the, I, the i just can't get that black belt it won't come <laughs> like it won't go past here eventually oh, man. so this is like six years oh six years wow but uh, it just but it was this long after a year and a half okay and it just stops after a while but that's insane man because I don't think my beard could grow that long. Like if I just quit shaving for like a year and a half, I don't think that's going to happen. You could check. So that's some great beard genetics, man. <laughs> anyway, um, our buddy Antonio, he always joins these live chats. He says, Mr. Eric, can you share with us a bit about your journey from being a gymnast and weightlifter to becoming a martial arts and actor? Yes, this is a great way to start. We want to kind of get, get your background on how you became the no very well-known stuntman. Yeah, I, uh, it's actually, uh, I took some, some martial arts when I was 12. I took uh, Kempo Karate at a strip mall. I got my yellow belt and hated it, so I left. Mm -hmm. and uh, I never wanted to do martial arts again. That was terrible. And I uh, got into weightlifting instead, and um, I wanted to look like Arnold, oh, sure. and, uh, which is, like, really hard to do with just weightlifting. <laughs> <laughs> You could look like Stallone, but you're not going to look yeah. like Arnold. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I, I got a little, but I got really strong, um, and, uh, and I was always kind of naturally strong, but um, did some gymnastics too, which got, also got me strong. I was naturally good at like rings and um, uh, the P bars, but uh, uh, the floor actually P bars, whatever. And so like it, because you know I could I could you know do some kind of do some acrobatics on the floor. Um, and I was strong. It, it, it was like when I started falling on the ground, <laughs> there's just something, uh, where if you're strong, I don't know, falling on the ground just doesn't hurt as bad. I don't know what it is. Um, I think I, I like to think that the weightlifting helped me be strong enough to hit the concrete. Um, I think it helps. So you know it's interesting. I, and that, that's, that's a good point. I do think there is a a distinction between strong and tough and weightlifting though it makes you stronger i think it makes you tougher if you push through it especially if you're going to failure you know so it, it's really the toughness i think man because most people fair. will not want to do that even if they're strong they're like i ain't yeah. taking that fall on the concrete yeah yeah who knows maybe maybe uh maybe weightlifting had nothing to do with it but at any rate that was the first thing i did and That's then cool. after after i started just you know my first stunt was a hong kong spin and uh landed right on my elbow on my ribs <clears throat> and I was like, that was terrible. I'm going to do it again. So I did a Hong Kong spin a couple of times and realized I could hit the concrete. And, um, and then I was hooked, started making action movies. And then I got back into martial arts and didn't really stop after that. I started with Taekwondo after that, uh, literally opened up, a opened up a phone book when I moved to San Francisco for film school, <laughs> went to the martial arts section, tried the first one. Hey, he's a weirdo. Tried the second one. This is Taekwondo so dude. And uh, like went with Taekwondo because the guy, my teacher, Andy, Andy Leung, uh, he ended up doing contour with me. Uh, okay. And so like because he wanted to make movies, too. So it was a great it was a great match. I'm curious, like, what was it about Ken Po that you didn't like when you started like at 12? Uh, because I was probably. Uh, oh, I know. 
because for some reason they put me in a kid with a bunch of like uh, in a in a class with a bunch of eight year olds, mm-hmm. and and so uh, I left. I just didn't like it. <laughs> you just dominate. I think I think the teacher. Oh, I, you know, another thing was that the teacher every time he'd give you a belt, he'd kick you. Like if you earned your belt, he'd kick you. And he was kind of a mean dude. And I just didn't like him. You got to block it. <laughs> he's seen a few. No, he, you yeah, know, you weren't allowed to block it. Oh, really? Oh, that's crazy. Wow, it. one of those instructors. Yeah, one of those instructor, instructors. Kind of had a bad taste in my mouth for martial arts. For I could see that. Yeah. I was thinking you probably just didn't have the right instructor. Of course. That's always, yeah. that's always bad martial arts, right? <laughs> you can't take yeah. a good martial art class with a bad teacher. It doesn't exist. Hmm. <laughs> Well, Johnny did pretty good in the Karate Kid, I guess, though. He was dominating with the bad teacher, but, yeah. Yeah. well, that's a movie. Uh, speaking of movies, so you're really primarily into the Hong Kong films, right? I was. Uh, that was my main inspiration when I was doing films like Contour. I was just obsessed with them. Now, now I didn't start as a stuntman. Um, when I was 16, 15, uh, I got a job as a PHP programmer and a visual basic program out of college. So I was kind of a tech nerd when I was 15 and I wanted to work in a particle accelerator. I was taking calculus and physics and all this. And, um, and I learned how to make a website. This is back in 1998, back before WordPress, before YouTube, oh, sure. back when, back when the internet was like, you got to open up notepad and type out a web website with That's HTML crazy. and then <laughs> upload it to a server and hope that nobody hacks you. Right. Mm. And, um, and so I, uh, started reviewing Hong Kong movies on this website. Cause I just, I, I got really into the action. I, I would just review the action and I did like 500 Hong Kong movie reviews. And I went to Hong Kong, came back with a suitcase full of video CDs, reviewed all of them. So I had like 500 Hong Kong movies that, that I had analyzed and analyzed just the action. I didn't even like pay attention to the story. I was just doing it for the action. I'd break these things down. I'd put all the photos and I'd talk about the stuntmen, tried to name the uh, name the stuntmen, name the movements. You know, there was another site at the time called Project J. He was kind of doing stuff like that too with Jackie's movies. What, was that a YouTube? Was it a YouTube? Oh, that's before no. YouTube. Oh, you were doing like, you were like a YouTuber before YouTube. He's a website guy. <laughs> yeah, was a website. yeah, man. I was a fortune city guy. If anybody knows what fortune, fortune city wow. was, I had a fortune city website. <laughs> and so, um, so that was like really where I was like learning cinema from and learning, uh, action design from was just analyzing these Hong Kong movies. And at one point, you know, I'd done 500 of these reviews and I thought, well, let's just, let's just get a camera and do this. Like it seems easy to do. And we just started doing it. You know, we didn't wait for anybody. We didn't wait for funding. We we're all a bunch of 18 year olds anyway, in my hometown. Might as well just do it. So that was like the first thing we did was I, I did that for like 15 years doing this very Hong Kong style of shooting and movement and everything. Right. Which is like which is kind of a weird, <clears throat> difficult uh, skill because, you know, the Hong Kong movie style, uh, they do what's called under cranking, where they shoot the film at 20 or 22 frames per second. So it's actually faster when mm-hmm. they play it back. And so when you move, you're not moving at full speed. You're sort of moving at a slightly like 90% speed and you're really accentuating the shapes. Mm. And we didn't know that. We thought we were just supposed to move that fast. And so we were trying to keep up. (laughs) So we would think like really fast as we were trying to come up with these action scenes. We ended up like developing some kind of difficult habits uh, when we started doing American stunts. Like one of the things was that it was really hard to slow down. Mm. Because sense. in American stunts, you know, they, they want you to give like a lot of character, a lot of character in the movement. And I, I remember doing an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode and one of the stuntmen pulled me aside. He's like, dude, slow down. You are going, <laughs> you're going like three times faster. You look weird. <laughs> yeah, they didn't invite me back to that one. Mm. And, uh, and so like that was my first sort of language of, of action. Even though before that I'd watched American B films, it was really the Hong Kong action style that caught me. Okay. Um, so that was the first style that I learned. But then when I got to do God of War, then I had to learn the American style. Mm, for sure. So you became like completely obsessed, though, with these Hong Kong films, specifically like the, the fights. I mean, if you're dissecting 500 of them and, and putting up on a website and breaking them down, I mean, you've literally be, you were a, a completely obsessed with this stuff. Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah hey, here's a, a here's a comment from Ken Po Joe real quick. 
He's a he's a martial arts historian. Hey, he's my teacher. No, I'm just kidding. Are you serious? Okay. No, well, he said he said that the kick of rebirth is a Parker Kenpo tradition. Sorry, you had a bad Kenpo experience. So I took Kenpo too back in the day. I never got kicked. So <laughs> my experience was much better. Hey, Ed Parker was such a like childhood hero for me because I was a I was a big Pink Panther fan. Okay. And uh, Ed Parker is in uh, Pink, the Revenge of the Pink Panther. I think yeah. he's got this great fight scene. And I always like remembered that fight as like having so much character. So I have nothing against Kempo, just against. Well, I mean, you can't, you know, because if if anybody ever watched Jeff Speakman in The Perfect Weapon, you got to love totally. Kempo. Yeah, totally. <laughs> For that fact alone. Yeah. Hey, here's a, here's a cool question from Antonio. He said, being runner up for the 2006 MTV Movie Awards is a huge achievement. How did that recognition influence your future projects? And what mm. did you win it for? Can you let the audience know? Uh, Undercut was runner up for best short film in 2006. That was pretty cool. That got us a lot of attention. Um, at the time, uh, I was just finishing up Contour. So when we released contour, you know, we were able to sort of promote it, uh, as like the team that did the film that got the runner up for MTV <laughs> movie, you know, best short. So it helped for sure. Like we would, uh, we'd go to comic con we put the laurels up, you know, on, uh, on the, on the video screen. And, uh, we, you know, we, we did okay, pretty well when we first released contour in like 2007, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I think that that, that that nomination really helped us. Yeah, that's to credit to uh, Steve Reedy also. I mean, he directed Undercut. It's a fantastic movie. It's on my channel. Um, watch it. It's 30 minutes. I mean, Undercut Undercut came before Contour. Um, and really the character for Law uh, in Contour was inspired by a character that we created in Undercut. But mm -hmm. Steve Reedy, you know, he shot Contour also. But his his way of storytelling was very inspiring for me, and I you know I I gotta credit that guy a lot for uh, for what he did. So Undercut is like a that's a great film. Okay, okay. And you, I, I see that, and I've seen some of these on YouTube, and then digging through your IMDb, I mean, you have like a ton of short films. Like, was the and I know you've gotten attention and recognition from them. What was the ultimate goal, though? Was it just to make a great short film, or were you really trying to get Hollywood's attention, or what was like the ultimate goal with these great short films in the action genre? Yeah, you know, I talked to somebody about this recently. Um, you know, we we did it because we loved it. That was it. Like okay. we did it for no pay. We didn't expect anything. I mean, you talk about like if you you look at Contour. Every single guy that you see in that movie with a ski mask is one of the main actors <laughs> because we didn't have enough people. You know, we did it because we loved it. I mean, we ate pavement for that movie. Um, and I, I always tell people that, like, if you if you want to do indie films, you have to love it. Like the money comes later. The fame. Forget it. Just don't even think about it. If you love it, do it. And then like the, the other great things will come from there. And you don't know what those things will be. And really, like. You know, for us, talking about the era of 2001, right? This is when we started. And Hong Kong cinema had sort of like nosedived uh, in terms of its like martial arts action. And it had come over to the States for, for a brief moment in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Because like with the, with the Hong Kong handover to China, a lot of those Hong Kong actors, like all the big ones came to America, right? In Australia, right? Jackie, that was when Jackie was doing Rush Hour, you know, Shanghai Night. Shanghai Nights, Shanghai Noon, and all the stunt guys were coming over to America and in, and like basically showing American stuntmen like how this is done. <laughs> right? It was a big wake up call for a lot of American stunt guys, and you'll see this with like a lot of a lot of the guys that worked with Sam Hung on Martial Law at the time. And like The Matrix is a Hong Kong movie, man. I don't care what you say, like that's a Yu Wu Ping action film because mm -hmm. it's not shot like an American action film, but. That that sort of sentiment, sort of that that style of action in America was a great like golden age for us. And we were so excited. We thought that if we learned the Hong Kong style, we would have an in in mm -hmm. Hollywood. 
because it just made sense, right? We were seeing, you know, Crouching Tiger was an international hit. It's like, oh, we'll learn Wuxia, you know, Matrix. Oh, we'll learn Kung Fu. We'll be able to do movies just like these guys. And then, like, something happened, like, around 9-11. And then we got into, like, born Identity territory. And mm. I look back at – I look at born now, and I see some, like, beauty there. But at the time, I really just couldn't see, like, how how are we supposed to – be great performers in a, in a movie like Born. How do we do what we do? So to us, it was like, well, screw it. Let's just keep on doing the Hong Kong thing on the side and just make, and just keep, keep that torch burning. That's what we wanted to do. So to us, it was, it was almost, it was like kind of religious in a way, right? Like we have this thing that we were inspired by. It's what brought us together. This is community that we formed online. And we, we had a forum on my website. We'd share sound effects. We'd post all of our short films this is before YouTube. Right. This is like 2000, 2001. We had a community across the world and we were all united by this thing. And then suddenly it's like Hollywood's like, no, we're going to do shaky cam and rapid fire. Editing. <laughs> and yeah. we all were like, all right, guys, well, we got to hunker down and like keep this torch burning. And we just did it because we loved it. And look where we are now. John Wick is sort of like a revival of the Hong Kong style. And everything's cyclical, you know, it, it, it took a while to come back, but it came back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, of all those films that you've done, you know, of course you got Death Grip, Rope of Dope, Blindsided. Uh, there's so many. Like, which one are you like the most proud of and why? Uh, well, I think that the one that, oh, that's, that's a tough one because like, like there are different sort of like, um, sort of different elements, right? Like I think that Rope of Dope 2 is probably the most performative of anything I've ever done. It's probably the most performative. And that was like, even just like on a comedic level and storytelling, that was sort of like when I hit my stride. Um, but then in terms of just character, I think Blindsided is like really up there. And that was Clayton directing me. And that was a moment for me to just, you know, really like tackle acting and performance in a new way. And, uh, and I took it very seriously. You know, I trained with a blind guy um and then enjoyed every moment of that um so yeah if, I, if, if we could have done something where it's like we because we just didn't have, we didn't have enough time in blindsided we had one we basically shot that entire thing in like a week and a half with no money right well rope it up too was pretty leisurely we got like six days to shoot that tiny short film okay um and so that's why the action is like off the wall um those are the two that i would pick <laughs> cool man hey here's a question about uh death grip uh antonio says death grip in 2011 was a significant project for you what inspired the story and how did you navigate the challenges of funding the production man that story was inspired by uh, a friend of mine who ended up in jail really yeah i didn't even think about this because the script went through like a million versions and then years later as i'm thinking about like well, how the hell did i come up with this movie idea and uh and i was and it was this sort of like really hard time in my life that's why that movie's like super dark um but i think everybody goes through a dark patch at least once and you got to get it out sure uh, i was watching a lot of beat takeshi takeshi katana movies at the time so there's a lot of kind of like takeshi katana style humor um, but you know, you never want to be too funny in a Takeshi Katana movie. You got to kill somebody pretty quickly after a joke. <laughs> um, and, uh, so in terms of uh, the, um, the funding, you know, I, I, I had my life savings that I had been saving up for years, knowing that I wanted to do something like this. Um, I dumped all that in there. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and then I, you know, we made like a very simple, LLC like you're supposed to. And I raised like another 50 maybe from friends, colleagues, family. And, uh, and there it was, and then we, I think we had like 10,000 from Indiegogo also. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that money, like that money worked out for us. You know, we, we definitely carried us through the hell of a lot more than we had to make contour. Sure. You know? Wow. So you're really known uh, of course from these films and you could find a lot on youtube but 
I guess you had like a ton of success in the video game space though. Right. Uh, yeah. That's here's a question for my buddy, Nick, you know, how, how is it working in the video game industry, by the way? Well, I would say, um, you know, I had a brief stint between, um, you know, rope a dope and, uh, working in video games in Hollywood. I did a few Hollywood gigs. Um, not many. I, I think that I'm not cut out for it. Uh, there's, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't live in LA. I never did. Okay. So I had to commute. And okay, so you're in California though. Wouldn't they pay for your travel? I was in California, but no, they wouldn't. I mean, I was, I was just trying to hustle at the time. Okay. I was starting from like the bottom floor still. So mm -hmm. even though I had done all these indie films, um, and the, the people who brought me on were my seniors. They were always the, the, you know, like the head guys at 87 would be the ones that would call me, you know, I say, okay. hey, come in and like do this gig. Um, but I think that it, it's a, it's a life where like, if you don't live in LA and if you're not in the, um, in the gyms regularly, it's very difficult to, to have a life in stunts there. So I, I, and I was, I couldn't move to LA. I just wasn't going to do it. Um, I had recently, you know, met my wife and we were in the Bay area and that was where my family was. And I was just, oh, okay. Okay. Stay there, you know? And then, um, and, uh, you know, we had a, um, started raising a family there. <clears throat> and so, um, so when I, you know, I, I, I did some previous jobs overseas, uh, in like China, for example. And then when I came back from China, I was just like sick as a dog. Cause I, I think I accidentally ate dog in China. Really? Yeah. I mean, on set one night, the director is like, here, try this food. It was delicious. I'm like, what is this? Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't quite know what I ate, but it made me deathly ill almost. I came home and I just was like, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to go overseas again. I don't like doing any of this stuff. I don't like being away from home. Um, I just want to focus on myself. I started doing Tekken in real life in my garage. And then that got me noticed by Sony Santa Monica. Hmm. And they brought me in to do uh, Kratos for God of War, to do the stunts for Kratos. Oh, and that transition going from, you know, Hollywood to video games, um, you know, that, that's a, it's a very different world in video games. Like if you, if you compare Hollywood to this sort of, it's sort of a marketplace of stunt as a stunt man, you know, you're kind of going from gym to gym to gym, trying to meet coordinators. You're schmoozing at different, you know, gatherings and whatnot. You're trying to go to UFC parties and, and you're trying to crash sets and wrangle pads for this guy and do previs for this guy. Um, that's a very different life than trying to do stunts in video games where, in order to do stunts in video games, you basically have to breach a castle wall of the video game company. And like, how do you get into a video game company? It's extremely difficult. And so when they called me to go in, I started just like making inroads and making sure that I stayed there. Um, and uh, so it's a very different business. Uh, but in terms of performance, doing video game motion captures, nothing like movie stunts, <laughs> nothing. Uh, and I can get into that more if you want. Uh, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I, I'm curious. We'll have to dig into that. Uh, hey, you might have somebody here who wants to invest in one of your projects. By the way, <laughs> this guy said, "How do you get? Uh, how do we get in touch with you for future potential projects as an investor?" So let people know how to get in contact with you. Oh, cool. Uh, you can uh, you can reach me at uh, uh, booking at ericjacobus.com. Actually, you can. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. I don't have any social media anymore. I'm really a Luddite now. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think my booking at Eric Jacobus, you can just do the Eric Jacobus at gmail.com. That's a safe one. The Eric, Eric Jacobus. There you go. That, that's an easy I'd one. be happy to talk to you. To remember. Uh, speaking of future projects, I had a question I wanted to ask you. Like, what's your ultimate goal? Like, is there a dream project? that you would love to make be it a short a feature or i don't even maybe something even in the game video game space but is there like a dream project i have a uh, i have a script called violent rhythm and we have a proof of concept for it um i'll release it at some point it's animated and you know i own and run a motion capture studio i'm here right now this is not a motion capture room this is my mad science library uh motion capture studios behind this wall here okay. and um and we do uh we're able to make uh, a film using motion capture fairly easily um and the things that you can do with motion capture uh in action um 
you know, I, I think that we're, we barely scratch the surface of what's possible. And I have a film that's like a really fun concept uh, that I would love to get off the ground. But an animated feature film is very difficult and very expensive to put together. Um, and it's I have like, a quick, quick yeah. question about that. Um, now, somebody that we're involved with, and you know who I'm thinking about, uh, and he started talking about anime, is Vic oh, Mignogna. Oh, Vic Mignogna, one of the biggest voice actors in the world. Yeah, and we do a lot of stuff with him. Good friend of ours. Um, probably somebody that interesting to do. He even has a voice, a studio where they do the voiceovers for the Japanese animes. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. Talk to him. Send him the script, see if he likes it. Would be nice to have you guys talk. Maybe we'll have uh, hook them up. I think yeah, it might would be great. great. Yeah, for sure, man. So this this animated project. So it sounds like you and your team would be basically performing the the movements, the fighting, the the motion capturing, all of that. Yeah, yeah. The way that the way that I would approach it, um, and I learned this from doing video games. And by the way, like there's, it's not just an animated action film. It's an animated action comedy musical. And okay, <laughs> the main character, yeah, yeah, the main character, and it's not a high school musical type musical. Um, the music is the action scenes, so it's a, it's a it's like a Running Man uh, style game show where contestants go on and they perform with an instrument. The main character is a violinist, and they perform in like the most incredibly dangerous uh, situations possible, and they try and complete a song basically in these very dangerous situations, right? And so he has to get through these challenges involving fight scenes and whatnot. So the violin is part of the fight scene. But what you have to consider is like, if he's playing a violin and he hits a guy, well, that's a note right there. When he goes, Rip, like, that's a note. So how do we, how do I, I, I'm not a composer. So I have to choreograph with the composer. You think about that. I have to make the fight with the music composer. And so it's an interesting way to like design action that I would, I think is like super exciting. And I, I don't think it's really been done. It's, you know, the closest is probably something like um, uh, Whiplash, right? Whiplash where mm. the music is part of the scene. It's not like a cutaway. It's like instrumental to every scene. It's it's kind of like that. And yeah. I mean, if there's one thing you never lacked, it's originality. Cause I, I, I watched the interview that Scott Atkins did with you and he was like, uh, you know, like you, you, you had these great ideas and he was like, I wish I came up with that first. <laughs> you know? so here's another one, man. This sounds pretty. Yeah. Like I haven't seen anything like that. It sounds amazing, man. Yeah. And then, so with, with that, with that, I mean, you, you have to have like three performers, right? You have to have, well, you have to have an, a stunt performer doing the action. You Then you need a violinist to do the accurate violin movements. If it's the same person, that's great. It's going to be difficult. It's possible. Uh, and then you need a voice actor. So what I would probably do is I would shoot the entire movie as a radio play with, with voice actors and get them done and then let them sort of dictate the cadence of all the dialogue. And then we would dub the action over that. So we would like dub a movie over the voiceover. <laughs> That's organic, you know, that way they're not forced into acting, you know, at specific moments and whatnot. They can dictate the pace. Very cool, man. Very cool. Uh, here's another great question. Antonio, he always has good questions. Uh, he's asking, working with a team of 30 plus members in the stunt people, must have been quite an experience. How did you manage such a large group effectively? Uh, I didn't. I was not effective at all. I was a horrible leader. Um, oh my gosh! Like, I mean, every, you know, uh, it's you're a bunch of like 22 year old males, and there are some females too. And oh man, it was such a crazy time. Um, one thing that one thing that helped was every Sunday we would get together and do um, op we do um, stunt class from like noon till 9 p.m. We just take oh, it wow. okay. all, day. School all day. And a lot of it was like messing around, doing martial arts, trying new stuff, um, you know, hitting on girls, obviously. Uh, <laughs> we would shoot short films. Like these guys would be over here shooting a short film. We'd be shooting this and I'd be getting contour ready over here. Uh, and then we'd play stunt ball. And then we'd all go out to eat and stay out till 2, 2 a.m. And then I'd go to class the next day at 6 a.m. And so like that kind of like weekly getting gathering together, uh, that really kind of held things together. I mean, we, and we continued doing that while we were making contour, mm -hmm. uh, we did that for years and that really helped keep the group together. And then kind of like, as, as soon as that, 
I, I accidentally forgot to lock the door at the Taekwondo school one night and we got kicked out basically. Oh, and, really? wow. and then like, you know, the group kind of like disintegrated soon after that. Um, but yeah, you know, I like it, it's and like, I, I keep in contact with a lot of those guys. Um, but you know, when we were at 30 people, <laughs> that was madness. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I imagine. So did some of these guys and or girls like end up going big in Hollywood or did they get into video games too? Or did they stay independent or did they, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you look at guys like uh, Dennis rule, for example, has done really well in video games. He does the call of duty games now. Oh, cool. Um, Vlad Rimberg, uh, he's all over doing TV shows. He's, I think he's second year directing shows now too. And wow. he does some big stuff. Um, you know, but I, a lot of, you know, a lot of the sort of like stump people alumni, you know, they, we were all very indie kind of oriented and, you know, it, there wasn't a big drive toward going to Hollywood for us. Like to us, it was about the art form. Um, a lot of the guys, you know, after we, after the stump people, you know, they just got, went back to doing martial arts because that's what they love. They didn't do it for fame. Mm. Uh, and I didn't either, you know, I, I just wanted to do cool art and I do all kinds of art now too. Mar you know, like motion capture is an art form to me now oh, and I, sure. do, I, I do writing now. And so, uh, so that's, a, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a different path that we took. Um, so. Speaking of martial arts, uh, this guy is asking who's the best martial artist you ever worked with and learned from? uh mark DeCoscos. oh that's that's amazing yeah i interviewed him a couple of years ago you know because i was always i grew up i seen only the strong and it blew me away you know because i've never seen capoeira and all the gymnastics side in the martial arts so yeah that that's incredible uh, yeah he's he's an amazing performer even to this day at his age an amazing performer and he's a great guy you know he's a great guy um it's just rare to find a guy like that who's achieved as much as he has. And he has the personality of somebody who is just doing art, you know, and that's, that's very hard to find. You know, when you talk to a guy like that, he's not trying to sell you. He's not trying to like book himself on the next thing. He's not trying to see what, what you have that he can get from you. It's not like that. He's just a different dude. He just, just operates on like a, a better level than that. The high quality guy. That that's great. Yeah, that's good to hear. And I think you met him doing like a Mortal Kombat. Was it a web series? Yeah, yeah. For uh, it was for Machinima back then. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and I was I, I was a green. You know, again, this is my early in my Hollywood career. This is 2012, and uh, you know, it was a stunt man being pulled in to do an acting role, basically. Um, and I was just like a total fish out of water and guys like him and Casper Van Dien is another guy. He's not like a martial artist, but just as an actor and as a guy, mm -hmm. another quality guy. Um, and they, they were like, they saw that I was scared and <laughs> didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, they just made it easier for me. Um, okay. Whereas like, you know, a, a, a mean spirited person might've like tried to make it harder for me mm. to show me what it's like or something. Right. Because maybe that happened to them and they want to, you know, exploit other people now, but they're not yeah, like, that. okay. Uh, is that, is that aspect something you didn't really want to pursue too much as far as like the acting, the dialogue, all that, because you, you come across pretty natural in your short films and stuff that I've seen. You know, I, I, I don't mind doing that. Um, I'm not good at auditioning. Hmm. I've always had a hard time auditioning. I'm not good at acting classes as I don't know if that makes any sense, but like if I'm, I don't know, I have a very hard time committing to an acting moment if it's not being reported for the final thing. It's just it's like, I get uh, yeah, I could see that's hard to get there unless it's like you're really there, you know, like, um, and that's where that that's where like the skill comes in, right? For like, yeah, I could be natural, but there's a skill component there that I don't have that mm. a trained actor like as a trained actor you learn how to audition you learn how to do cold reads you learn how to put a camera up and act something like a role that you that is like totally unnatural to you but you're going to make it work like that's where the skill comes in and uh, that was like that i i think that there are just many people who are far better than 
far better than me at that. Okay. You know, it's funny. I was speaking to one of my friends. Shout out to Nemo if you're watching, by the way. And he's got a, a film coming out pretty soon with Van Damme's daughter, Bianca, and also uh, Eminem's brother. But he was telling me, because like a lot of the auditions now, you just do them, you know, you send it in. So even if, because I know a lot of really great actors suck at auditioning, you know, but if they could spend time and work on it and film it and just like, okay, this is the one and send that in, then their odds of like booking the role are that much greater. So, mm, yeah. you know. Yeah, auditioning stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe I'd be better now. I, I, it, I don't know. I think I've, I've gone through a lot more in life. I have a lot to draw from. <laughs> I can, I can, I that can draw helped. tears. Yeah. I can draw laughter. I can, you know, I can do that stuff now. Whereas, you know, ten years ago, I was just, I was still a kid. Here's another cool question from Antonio. By the way, he says, as a filmmaker, what themes or messages do you aim to convey through your work? Okay. Um, I have two answers to this. Uh, the first one is, um, this is an answer for, uh, people ask sometimes, how do I shoot my action film? How do I make my action film? And I used to have a very set answer. I would say, well, look at Hong Kong films, look how they do it. I don't do that anymore. I say, how do you, I just ask a question back. How do you see reality? Right? How do you perceive reality? <clears throat> when when something flies by you, do you turn and look at it or do you let it fly past you so that you can keep looking where you're looking? How do you see reality? How do you experience the world? Show that to people, right? Do it, do it the way that you see reality. People will catch on, right? The way that the born identity director and editor see the world, it's very different than the way I see the world. Sure. Uh, the way Neil Blomkamp sees the world, it's very different than the way that I see the world. And when I watch a Neil Blomkamp movie, you know, I, I sort of, you sort of get into his head. You don't even have to have the audio on. You can just sort of look at the way he chooses his shots and the way he moves camera and the way that he pieces things together. And I go like, damn, there's no way I could do that. And I kind of enjoy the experience of being in his head for a moment. And so what I like to do is like try and convey how I see the world. Um, and I don't really know how I see the world. I just put it in the film. And, and I read the top YouTube comments and that's how I see the world. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to, I like to, you know, try and, um, uh, the, the message, like for example, and rope it up Two, that I was trying to convey is that, uh, and I, and I keep pushing this message now, um, is that, uh, you know, so much of, you know, the crisis of violence is due to, you know, escalation between people and a lot of the time it's like it's not very obvious why the fight starts right it's not very clear it's like if you watch the duelists ridley scott's duelists um you know what starts as an insult becomes this like lifelong rivalry <laughs> and i think that that's that kind of stuff is so human right <laughs> these like little nuanced things that we do these like like these tiny little uh drops in the pond and this little butterfly effect that can like come back as like a big wave and hit you in the face. And then you hit him back and he pulls a knife and everyone, everybody's dead. Right. That can be funny. Right. <laughs> Everybody dying can be funny. Um, but like, that's, that's something that I like to point to as like an absurdity and like a truth about human nature, which is that like these little tiny things that we don't even think about uh, can cause uh, a fight, which can turn into a feud, into a civil war, into a world war. And that's how things go in this world, man. Um, and I think that that's heavy. You think on the, the psychological part, huh? I find that I think that's interesting. A lot of people write movies, but there's no real. I can't relate to that character because I don't see something in that character in me. And when they reveal something that you know irritates me, but I, nobody ever knows that irritates me. But I see that character losing their. You know, you can always relate and say, "Oh man, yeah, I got that same temper." Yeah, like I, that's like one of the beautiful things of someone like, uh, you know, Chaplin or the Marx Brothers is that they, you know, they, they, they put themselves, uh, they, they sort of put themselves out there as the fall guy, right? Where like you expect the audience is going to laugh at you because of how ridiculous you are, because you're being making a fool of yourself, right? But you're not actually self-deprecating. 
because you're at the center of the scene and you're help you're having people not only are they laughing at you but they're identifying with you so the audience ends up laughing at themselves and that could be a conversion experience for people and that can bring people out of a movie theater going like man i mean i you know like the great dictator and it's like man i laughed at that movie but something changed on the inside after i saw that you know it's interesting and that, you say that because what's his name was used uh charlie chaplin the other movie uh producer it's interesting. The guy we just had on last time. Oh, Canon Fil- uh, Sam Sam Furstenberg, Canon Films yeah. director. He went yeah, right to the same. Office. When I asked something like that, he went right to the same. That's interesting yeah. that you're saying it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like a. I think that that and Jackie Chan really is like very similar to this, right? Like he, he and he doesn't play a goof, but he plays a guy who doesn't want to fight. And so, as an audience member, you're you, you're in this kind of double bind, right? Where you you go in to see Jackie Chan fight. And now you're in Jackie Chan's head and he doesn't want to fight. So you are like, oh, I don't want to fight, but I want to see him fight. And it's this like tension and he's trying to get out of the fight. And that's genius, right? To play it like that. And I think he's really like that, right? I think that he's actually like the movies where he fights the hardest are when he's directed by Sammo Hung or mm. Stanley Tong, or like Stanley Tong. Um, yeah, Stan, Stanley Tong. Yeah, Stanley Tong. Uh, but the movies where Jackie's in control, like he doesn't, he doesn't want it. And uh, it's always like a last resort to him. Okay. Um, and, and you, you, you inject a lot of comedy in your films. So I'm assuming obviously Jackie Chan was a huge influence for you. Uh, I got a question though, because you, you did go through and reviewed like 500 Hong Kong films. What, what are like your top five? Do you have a top five? Oh. Um, I, a drunken master too is like, Oh yeah, of course. Sort of the showstopper. Um, I don't know. It's hard to top that. Uh, Prodigal Son, like definitely in my top five. Maybe it's the top one. Uh, oh, Sam Hawkins, okay. Prodigal Son, yeah, 1981. Just in terms of, um, just as a like as a as an overall film, I think that 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 movie is like on a quality level that is like really difficult to achieve. Um, not just the story. I mean, the action. Like you can, you still can't make action like that. You still can't do it. And that movie is 45 years old almost. Mm. You know, I challenge anybody to make action like Prodigal Son. I don't think it'll happen. Um, oh, man. I mean, it's it's, oh, it's so hard to pick. Like, uh, I mean, a, a lot of my favorite movies are like Jackie and Sammo Hung movies. I love Dragons Forever just because of how fun it is. And I think like Dragons Forever inspired a lot of indie filmmakers just because it, it, it feels like a collaborative movie. You know, or like the four of the picking opera brothers are getting together and making these like super fun characters. Um, and uh, I was never much of a Shaw guy, uh, mm. Shaw brothers guy. I love Lao Galarung, um, but otherwise I was never really into Shaw. Uh, so, you know, if I were to pick one of his movies, probably Mad Monkey Kung Fu would be okay. my, my Shaw film of choice. Um, if I had to pick a, uh, a weapon movie, um, it would be uh, Blade, uh, the Blade. Excuse me, not Wesley Snipes, but <laughs> the Blade. It's the Blade. The Blade. Okay. Now, now, um, and uh, that's a Troy Hart's film. And then uh, for my fifth, I think I'll and everybody, everybody hates me for this, but I pick Legend of the Wolf as my favorite Donnie Yen movie hmm. because okay. it's a wuxia, it's a wuxia film without wires, and uh, I think it's I think it's a thing of beauty. Okay, speaking of Troy Hark. Even, you know, because a lot of the performers came out here to America like in the late 90s, but the directors like John Woo, Chow Hark, did two Van Damme movies, Knock Off and Devil Team. Like, did you watch those? What do you think of those? <laughs> Wasn't really into those. No? <laughs> Were you ever into Van Damme at all? Yeah, love Van Damme. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I mean, before my Hong Kong movie phase, yeah, I was in a small town. I didn't even know where Hong Kong was. And uh, I didn't know who Jackie Chan was or anything, so... The only martial art movies I knew were like Shoot Fighter and Best of the Best and and uh, Bloodsport. And so oh. I go through. I went through the whole you know martial arts section at the video store. And I saw all of Van Damme's movies, and I think like you you gotta credit Van Damme for like inventing the kick shape in America. You know, mm. like other, but before him, I I I know Chuck Norris kind of was that guy, but I think Van Damme turned it into a shape, made it a like you, you think in terms of comic books, right? Like the really iconic 
comic books have these shapes and these poses, right? And Chuck was really good at the, the, the performance aspect, but Van Damme made the shape. And I like how you're saying that. It's like the drawing. It's true. When he kicked, it's like a, like, that's how you would yeah. draw it in a comic book. Yeah. I mean, it's not even like a proper kick. Like he literally jumps up, spins, and just lifts his legs up like this. And as a kick, that's you're gonna fall on your ass if you do that. But, but like he makes a he makes a beautiful shape, and they knew how to shoot it. And he he might have been part of that decision where he's like, I'm gonna do this shape. I think he was part. I well, I know he was part of the editing. So luckily, they got enough coverage because you know in, in the posing. So he he's got the bodybuilding background. He's got the ballet background for the gracefulness. And then I don't know where he studied the filming part. I think it, it had to have been in Belgium. Actually, I think I heard some stories of, mm -hmm. of a photographer he was working with that would shoot certain angles. So, I mean, I don't know how much controllers say he had over some of his early productions because they had a great cinematographer for Bloodsport, David Worth, right? Yeah. Very seasoned guy. But I do know for a fact that Van Damme was in the editing bay so luckily they had enough coverage. He, he would get, you know, he does one kick. There might be three cuts and you might even see the hit twice and yeah. slow-mo. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, he definitely brought a certain style for yeah, sure. It's great. I mean, it really defined a generation. You got to give him credit for that. Oh yeah. And I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People who watch the channel, I'm all about blood sport. And yeah. Yeah. For the Van Damme yeah. movies for sure, man. But um, I have one more quick question for you and I don't, <clears throat> so you talked about humor in the martial arts. One of my favorite, and I think one of the funniest scenes is in uh, Return of the Dragon in the back, when they're in the back of the uh, restaurant and the guy's trying to use the nunchuck yeah, and he's yeah. whacking himself yeah. and he's trying to copy him. I don't, And that guy wasn't an actor, I think. I think there were like a bunch of some guy's friends, but I have to say the guy, I don't know if he thought of that or what, but he literally was the the. the but for me, I always laugh when I see that scene. Yeah. So like, I don't know, natural and uh, I don't know. It's funny because as a, as a viewer, you don't even have to know what nunchucks are for that joke to work. Yeah. Like that, that joke works because it's just anatomically correct. Right. It's like, and it's something that you wouldn't think of as an audience. member. I mean, as an audience member, you're sort of like used to Bruce doing the nunchuck thing. Right. So you're expecting yeah. that. And it, I imagine, I imagine, I could be wrong, that Bruce was behind that decision. I mean, he directed the movie. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, he knew he knew exactly what the audience expected, right? And he's a natural comedian because yeah. he knows exactly what the audience is. He's like, okay, they think he's going to do this. Okay, no, well, what happens when you actually pick up a pair of nunchucks and you start swinging? You hit your nuts and you hit yourself in the forehead. <laughs> You're going to do that, and the audience is going to get it. And he's right, you know? That's like, uh, and that's, that's something about, about Bruce is that he – you know, he knew he knew how to play the audience 100%. Um, he knew how to frame kicks. He knew how to he knew how to shoot. He knew how to perform everything. Uh, he, he didn't even have to like I mean, I would say that like his kicks were not up to snuff when he first started. He sort of learned this as he went. He watched like Big Boss. He's pretty raw. But before that, even in a, a, like a, <laughs> I, I was going to say Batman, Green Hornet. In Green Horn, his kicks are really basic, right? But then when he goes to Hong Kong, he starts work, work, working with Lo Wei. You know, he had been learning the kicking in L.A. from these Americans. A lot of Americans who had come over and come from, like, Vietnam, like Chuck, and these guys that had brought kicks from Korea. And Bruce was figuring out how to shoot these things. Because in America, they weren't really shooting kicks. They weren't even making kick movies. Nobody was doing kicks in movies. I'm sure Bruce saw an opportunity there. And he probably knew that people – okay, well, people are expecting – you know, the chop sake, kung fu stuff. People are expecting that. Okay. But when I put my kick up here, it's going to, it's going to do something to people. And he was right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure um, Van Damme had to have been heavily inspired by Bruce Lee because Muhammad Kesey, Van Damme's best friend growing up, you know, who I interviewed and talked to quite a bit, told me they used to sneak in the theater as kids and watch the Bruce Lee movies. And you'll see a lot of the, the poses and all that stuff that, that Bruce and the noises. There's only like two guys you could think of that I could think of in martial arts movies who make these really iconic karate noises. It is it's Bruce Lee and it's Van Damme. It's it's yeah, nobody right. else, really, you know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so was Bruce Lee like an inspiration to you at all? Because you haven't really talked about Bruce much, aside from just, you know, 
Yeah, you know the the only Bruce Lee movie I ever I ever saw growing up was Enter the Dragon, and I saw that when I was young, and that's a horror movie, right? The end of that movie is scary. And as a kid, I was like, I don't, I don't want this Bruce Lee guy. He's scary. Um, he never really inspired me uh, until much later. Um, I think I I got back into watching Bruce's movies, and you know, like the also the ed, the the versions that we had growing up were these full screen. Mm. pan and scan dubs that are just embarrassing I, I i know some people think that they're kind of fun but i just i hated watching movies like that so then i got a i think i think i don't know maybe it was dragon dynasty or someone who released the bruce lee movies later in the the 90s or something and they were widescreen i got to finally watch these things in their original format and uh and i i i think you know you're talking about the 70s which is a different different kind of era I grew up on the fast-paced Hong Kong stuff, mm -hmm. and Bruce is Bruce is much more of a Japanese-style performer. You know, one of the one of the rumors is that you know Bruce met Shintaro Katsu, who is Zatoichi. He went to Toei Studios, or or Shintaro came to Golden Harvest, one or the other. They met, and Shintaro Katsu told Bruce uh, before Bruce did uh, Fist of Fury, he said Bruce the way that you make your fights really work is by adding in what's called ma ma in Japanese is the pause. It's sort of the anticipation. Mm. Hong Kong movies don't really <clears throat> use ma. They don't really utilize the anticipation. It's sort of like rapid fire and musical. Sure. It's like a picking opera, right? Like Beijing opera. It's like, dang, 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 dang. You kind of keep the flow going. It's a flow state. It's very like intoxicating. Uh, but you compare that to like a Japanese film where Ma is everything. Like the buildup is everything because everybody's going to die. <laughs> That's the buildup. <laughs> you know, if this, if this sword comes out, everybody dies. So let's talk it out. Let's get And then it's really tense. And then when the sword comes out, everybody dies. And so that was Bruce's style. And so Bruce's films, you know, even though he's got, even though he's got a lot of, you know, Hong Kong performers that he's working with, um, it's a very Japanese style of action film. You know, nobody was really making movies like that in the seventies in Hong Kong. Mm, yeah, that's an interesting um, insight. Were you, were you ever inspired, like, by the uh, the Japanese swordman uh, movies of the fifties and like way back when the guys really were yeah. still training, like they were going to fight somebody with a sword? Yeah. You know, I never appreciated those until until much later in life. Because again, I was raised on that down 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 down. I was raised in the Beijing opera style Cantonese films, right? And uh, and then, like, and I was raised on Arnold movies too. It's totally different than a Chambara <laughs> film. Um, and it's like they're their own art forms. I never quite understood Chambara uh, samurai films. Never understood like what the big deal was. Like, why, why, why all this waiting around? Like, why, why are we trying to talk? Why don't you guys just fight? That was what I was thinking. <laughs> um, then two things happened. First thing that happened was when I did Blindside, and I took an Iaido class, a Japanese sword class, and I learned what is involved in drawing and cutting. <laughs> And that's all I did for all the class. It was, you know, you sit kneeling and you just draw and cut and then sheath, draw and cut and sheath. Sometimes you do the triple, you know, draw overhead and then wipe. <clears throat> and that's all I did. I sort of learned and then, um, you know, tried experimenting at my house and um, cut my finger open. And I realized like, oh, this sword, if it touches anybody anywhere, if it cuts two inches deep, that person's going to die. So that taught me one thing. And the second thing was when I was doing motion capture on a game called Demon Souls. I did mm, the protagonist the game, yeah. The character. Yeah, did the main character. And that's a Japanese game. And I had been doing God of War for two years before I did Demon Souls. And so I thought I was like the expert mocap guy. So I go in to do Demon Souls first day. And I'm like, I'm ready to do motion capture. And they say, okay, well, first move is the sword cut. So I did it kind of like Kratos, like a really big move, a lot of character. And the director's like, no, 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 no. You need to learn how to move in a Japanese way. And I was like, whoa. My, I had a Keanu Reeves like <laughs> mind moment. I was like, what does that mean? So I spent a year learning how to move in a Japanese way, whatever the hell that means, right? And what that meant ultimately, it was like a very like gradual anticipation, like trying not to show your cards before you do an attack. And then when, when you actually do the attack, you just get through the hitbox, hit an end pose, and then go back to your idle pose. Hmm. And after doing that for a year, I thought, okay, I can move like a Japanese guy. And then I watched a Chambara movie, and I understood it. Oh, that's cool. 
how long does it take to like motion capture games? So for example, like how long did you work on God of War? Uh, God of War, I did two years and I think I came in halfway through. What two, you mean you were literally like, were you going in like a nine to five job for two years? <laughs> no, it doesn't look like that. No, they, they usually call you in like two days a month. Oh, so you, a couple days a month. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, God of War Rag now, God of War Ragnarok, we did that here at the studio. We did the, the gameplay capture here. And our sales our first contract in my studio. And oh, that, wow. was a three, that was a three-year game. Wow. It was three years. And we would shoot, yeah, two or three days a month. But it was a lot. And plus shoots, we would do, we would act, now go there to their studio to do some um, uh, cinematic shoots. But we did, like, most of the gameplay here. Okay. How, how many people do you have on your team working, like, at your mocap studio? We have eight people. Oh, that's cool, man. Any of the guys from back in the day from that the stunt team? No, but you know, I you know who was just here it was Dennis. Dennis was just here, um, but now no, no, none of those. We had a full time stuntman working with us. His name is Phil. He worked with me on you know, all the games that we've done here. Um, but now I'm the only in house stunt performer. Okay. Yeah. Hey, here's a here's a question from Antonio. Sure. Uh, can you share a funny or memorable behind the scenes moment from one of your films that fans might not know about? Hmm. That's a tough one. Can we come back to that? <laughs> sure. About that. That's a tough one. There have been many. I, I yeah, I would think I feel like I'd have a hard time coming up with one. Quite a bit. Uh quite a few of them. Um are there are there any specific projects that you want to promote like right now that are coming out soon or things you're working on? Uh, well, um, I'm actually writing a book. Okay, it's, it's called The Art of Violence, and uh, it's a uh, it's sort of an encapsulation of my philosophy on action design and violence, and uh, and I'm you know it's it's I'm a little bit nervous. It's my first book. Uh, but I have kind of a, a novel theory on violence and language that uh, I think that is very readable. I think people will enjoy it. Even if you're an action film fan, I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that people will enjoy this because it's a different way of looking at violence, right? Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of the time we, what we hear from the media is that <clears throat> we hear one of two things. We hear uh, violent video games cause violence. And then we hear violent video games don't cause violence. Like, I don't know if it's so cut and dry as this. You know, I don't think violence is as cut and dry. Um, I think that there's a lot more nuance. And I think that also the, the, uh, uh, the way that uh, action films shoot their, their action scenes and why certain things sort of survive over, you know, in terms of uh, what we remember about a period, about an era. Um, is sort of dictated by what was going on at the time. Um, and I think like, you know, Born Identity is a good example. I think that maybe there's some, there's some aspect of how traumatizing something like 9-11 was to Americans that might have been like captured by the Born Identity films. Mm -hmm. And that over time, it sort of like makes more and more sense. Because there, there were a lot of other films at the time that were not shot like Born, like Star Wars Episode Three came out. Um, the Matrix films kept coming out. They weren't shot like Born, but Born is sort of like what stuck over mm -hmm. time in our memory. And so I think that there's like a very interesting feedback between like real world violence and art or language. And it's something I'm excited to explore. When do you anticipate this book might be out? I'm aiming for uh, uh, I'm aiming for fall 2024. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah, I definitely want to read that for sure. That sounds good. Hey, here's a here's a um, cool comment. Oh, I got a question related to this, by the way, from Dwayne Johnson. He says, I liked your interview on the art of action with Scott Atkins, which was a great interview. And Scott Atkins, he's an amazing performer, actor, martial artist, etc. And, you know, uh, he, he respects you a lot. And, and he talked about your your Kictionary video, which is insane. You know, like you basically doing every kick known to man and performing it, you know, <laughs> greatly. But the question I have is because he he even asked you too, 
like I, th I think he framed it as like what's the deal it's like you got all this talent you did all this these movies and you kind of explained earlier that you're not really a hollywood guy but have you ever thought or has he asked you to work on a film with them because i think you guys would do an amazing fight scene together there have been a few missed opportunities working with scott um it was nobody's fault it just didn't happen um i mean i he is like i think in terms of just like our industry he's sort of like the great martial art hero of my generation um so you know a guy who is great at acting uh he's very he's a very handsome guy some of us can't don't benefit from this as much as he does. I don't, don't quite have the look. I have, I have the looks for motion capture, um, but he's also extremely talented and, and he has a podcast. Like the guy's got a brain. That's the thing. He understands the entire process mm -hmm. of filmmaking. So he's like, this is part and parcel to his success is that he's able to see behind the action in ways that I think a lot of a lot of action stars, martial artists and whatnot, they, they can't, or they just choose not to. For him, he takes an active interest in how his films are shot, how it's edited. You know, he has a brand. And like, that's, that's like much, I mean, one of the things that I've, I found, like one of the most interesting insights that he gave me was that when he was doing Undisputed uh, 2, he was like, he was trying to figure out like how he moves. He didn't even know like who he was on camera. And he, he realized that he needs to stop posing. So he, he created this like no pose style of movement mm -hmm. where he's just like constantly moving. He didn't like strike the Hong Kong pose anymore. He stopped that, you know? And that's like very, very intuitive brand recognition on his part, right? Sort of like Donnie Yen's same method where like you figure out like what people are looking at with you. What do they want to see? And he figured that out. So, um, so I, I, that guy all around is like legendary <laughs> in like every way. And he's he's mentored me. I have a podcast too. And he mentored me when I was starting my podcast. Oh, nice. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, that, that guy's amazing. I nothing yeah. Else. And speaking of Undisputed 2 and the Boyka character, I mean, that was like his breakout. Like that, that was the movie, you know, Michael Jai White was good in it too, but that was <laughs> Scott Atkins is the one that really sticks out in that one. And that, that kind of like, when I seen that, I was like, who is this guy? Cause I'd never seen him before. I had to like look into him and like, what, what did he do before this? You know? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, it, it's kind of crazy. If you think about that, that movie is almost 20 years old, oh gosh, which is yeah. nuts. Cause he's still doing all that stuff now. Like I wouldn't be surprised if they came out with the fifth one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah it's, Isaac said that, you know, when they were, um, when they were sort of like, working through that character, I think they realized how, how much stock the audience was going to put in this character. And they knew that they had a future hero on their hands. Right. And that's why undisputed three is like a Boyka movie. Undisputed four is a Boyka movie. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a really, that's a super cool kind of like um, meta story for Scott, you know, like he's a stunt man who, who came up doing like Hong Kong movies, like Black Mask Two, and Extreme Heist. Is that what it was? No, not Extreme Heist. Extreme Challenge or something. Yeah, and, yeah Extreme Challenge. And like become and like becomes so much more than that. Like he's an icon. He's an action star uh, who can do anything. Um, yeah, he, he's a writer, a producer, has his own production company. So yeah, like you said, man, he does it all. Um, Here's here's a cool question, and I was kind of thinking about something like this too that I wanted to ask, especially because of a you know blindsided. Uh, have they ever had you on the set to help out with the stunts for the new series season for Daredevil: Born Again? Uh, nope, never been on Daredevil. Cause that that's even something that you you look like the character, like in Blindsided, and obviously you move like the character. I mean, that would be I think a perfect role for you, even. But even as an advisor for that, because you basically played it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, put my name out there. See if they uh... <laughs> put your name out there. Hey, there's Micah. Hey, Micah. Oh, dude. Oh, so yeah. You know what's funny? Like, so so Micah is Quan Kicker. He was a huge uh, YouTuber, and he kind of yeah. disappeared. And 
you know, I interviewed him not that long ago, but something cooler because <laughs> he found out like I was doing the opening of a Bloodstorm in Oklahoma. And crazy enough, he lives in Oklahoma. Now we did the majority of this film in Redding, California. But what? yeah, that, that's your old stomping grounds, right? Redding? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Micah had emailed me. And so he must have heard me say it on a video. He said, hey, I heard you're doing the opening or not. the But I heard you're shooting some of Bloodstorm in Oklahoma. I'd love to help out and just hang out on set or be a PA or whatever. And, you know, because I know his background, I'm just like. I, I, you know, I talked to Renee and they'd be like, I gotta, we gotta do a fight. I gotta do a fight scene with this guy. Like he's too good not to do a fight scene with. So we had a very, very cool uh, fight scene at the, uh, at the beginning of the film, you know, I'll talk, I'll talk about Micah for a second. Oh, um, sure. He was, he was, you know, very early on with us too, on the forums. Like he was there at the beginning, you know, one of those guys who was sharing sound effects with you know we had it was like it was like a commune almost we were just like hey i found i ripped the sound effect from this movie it's a good punch well i got this sound i got this good miss sound we'd like share all these things right and we'd share filmmaking tips and micah really like nailed the the youtube format and a lot of us looked to you micah uh for like dang how like you, you really hit on this sort of like he's you're a smart dude micah you know and uh, a lot of us were trying to crack that as well. Um, and uh, so kudos to uh, to Micah, man. Like that's and that was a lot of stuff. I mean, he was putting out a lot of stuff. I remember like there'd be something all the time. And and he he really took the uh, the real contact to the bank. Um, that was a uh, you know inspired by Ong Bak, I'm sure. But man, like you kind of took it to its logical extreme. Pretty freaking cool. <laughs> Yeah, he, he was cool to work with and a great performer, man. So, but yeah, cool trivia, man. And he was telling me about the old days, early YouTube and, and all that. But yeah, he really blew up, dude. Like everybody knows who Quan Kicker was back in the day, you know? Like I was watching his videos, you know, because uh, I have a Taekwondo background too. And he was mixing that with the Muay Thai and, and everything else. So cool stuff. So anyway, Eric, I know you had about an hour. We went a little bit longer. I do appreciate you joining this, these great stories that you shared and everything else. And it's really cool what you're doing now with the, the motion cap. The book sounds amazing. The dream project sounds amazing. And uh, yeah, that, you know, potential investor dude, hopefully he contacts you, you know, and maybe get that, that project up and running and we'll get, yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll hook you up with Vic Mignogna. Great voice. He just texted Vic me Mignogna. by the way. He's really oh. excited. He wants to. Uh, he wants to connect oh. with you. Yeah, we'll right. we'll, we'll link. Right. We'll link All you right. up. With number him, number one voice actor in the world. So he's it huge. Might be worth it. Yeah, yeah. we're putting the team together right now for the year project. Yeah, brilliant movie producer <laughs> to himself, man. Have you ever seen any of his work? The Star Trek stuff he did. No, I'll have to send it to you. It's a really brilliant guy. Uh, but really. he did a lot of the, the the famous anime like what Naruto, Dragon Ball Z, Burl, Full Metal Burl Alchemist. I have like four hundred of them. Burl so he's going to Burl conventions Burl. all the time, signing autographs, doing all kinds of stuff. So he's pretty oh, well known, well very well known in the community. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, wow. Yeah. Voice acting is like man that that's a that's a skill um, that's a, that kind of blows my mind that you can sit in a room and look at a line on paper and make that work for like for anything i'm always blown away by that so much respect to uh anybody who does that yeah he, he's great at that and he wants to do more live action i'm actually uh gonna work on a film with him later called possum kingdom hopefully we start shooting this year that's that's a very interesting project but yeah very anyway cool. we will connect you with this okay. guy I was trying to think of a funny story to convey to you guys. Oh, yeah. Back to Antonio's question. If, if you could think of something very funny or memorable that people may not know about. Um, you know, there was, a, uh, there was a moment when I was doing Tekken in real life in my garage. And, uh, and I was, uh, was married at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had been doing this Tekken in real life thing for eight months at the time. Right. And I, I, it got a little bit elaborate over time. Right. Like, like I, I started getting costumes and, and I think this day I was doing Paul Phoenix and I literally have this like <laughs> yellow chef's hat that I put on my head to like emulate his super hot, super tall, like crew cut. Yeah. And I had the, the red gear with the sleeves cut off 
and I just looked like a doofus. And my wife at the time, she comes in and, <laughs> and she's like, well, what are you doing? We have no money. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I'm doing something important right now. I promise you. I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted to do it. And again, I was just doing Tekken in real life because I loved doing it. It was a challenge, you know, like I was trying to emulate Tekken movements. And I did it because I loved it. I had no, I, I, like my best month on YouTube was like $800. It was my best month. That was when I was getting millions of views, 800 bucks on a month. Like that's not half of rent <laughs> where I was living at the time. So this was not going to work out. I didn't know where it was going. I just did it because I loved it. Fast forward about a month. That's when I get called to do God of War because they saw it. Oh, wow. So that paid off hugely. That's awesome. Yeah. Then it's not uh, just because I did Paul Phoenix with a yellow chef's hat. It's because I did 35 of these things. Oh, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> the consistency is what sort of like drove it because, you know, I talked to those animators regularly. And they say, you know, if you had only done like one video, we wouldn't have called you. But the fact that you had like 30 of these things and we could sit there for an hour and a half watching you, you know, abuse yourself while trying to copy tech and moves. Um, that is what kind of like made them pull the trigger. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a funny reaction video. So like they, they made a video about me doing God of War as the stuntman. And, uh, and part of that behind the scenes video <clears throat> showed my Tekken in real life. You know, I was like, you know, talking about how they saw me doing Tekken in real life. And then there's this funny reaction video. It's probably still out there somewhere of guys watching uh, of these two guys watching me talking about doing like Paul Phoenix in my garage. Right. And they're, they're and they're like, their, their response is, so you just have to like do Tekken stuff in your garage and you could be a stuntman in motion capture. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy as that. That's all you got to do. Like, yeah. Uh, 35 times, but yeah. Do it because you love it. That's what I always say. That's the secret to success. Yeah, that's cool, man. Well, Eric, thanks. This was great having you on, man. And thanks for sharing all those cool stories. And that's a great way to end this stream here. And uh, Richard says, great stream, guys. Thanks, Richard. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And yeah, we'll be back for the next one. Right on. Thanks, guys.